Welcome to Insights and Sound, where we talk to the people behind the scenes, behind the technology, and behind the music. People you may not know, but you should. And please check out getitinwriting.net forward slash shows for a full list of our podcasts and YouTube series. My guest is Jet Galindo. She is a mastering engineer at Bakery. Nice to see you. Nice to see you, Daniel. Thanks for, for coming here and, and joining me at the bakery. It's my pleasure, and it's so just gorgeous here. Yeah, it's like very art deco. <laughs> it really is. I love it. So I, I will want to hear about your, your work now, but I want to get a little bit of background on you, especially because having done some research on your career path, the first thing that struck me was you started with a degree in psychology. Yes. <laughs> and that's, well, first of all, it's incredibly useful in the music industry. It's, it's useful in anything in life, I obviously. Agree. Yeah, it's a very versatile career path for sure. But how did you, how did you divert from that to audio? What drew you to audio? Are you, are you a musician, first of all? Um, in fact, it's like more, the question should be more like, what drew me to psychology? Because everything else <laughs> in my world has been music. That's a good observation because uh -huh. my family, um, we are a family of musicians. My family manages uh, and trains um, pop bands in the Philippines. Really? Yeah. Oh, it's that's cool. Rock, I wasn't aware bands. of that. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I was just immersed in um, musicians rehearsing at home, um, learning all these like new um, pop songs during the day, rock songs. That's why I'm literally named after um, Joan Jett. Oh, yeah, I love that. Yeah, except I love that, that my parents decided to change the spelling of my first name to Joanne, but I was named after Joan Jett. And because my parents are musicians, um, they w made it a point to tell me to not pursue music <laughs> growing ah, up. Ah, so this was That's one of those thing. get a day yeah. job. Yeah, okay. Yeah, my parents tried that too, didn't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like, the more they tell you that, the, the more you want to yeah, rebel. I, I yeah, I think it gets like the guilt away from them when their <laughs> children decide to, to pursue. I tried to keep them <laughs> I away. I tried, tried to steer them right. Yeah, but mm -hmm. I, I think my parents um, jokingly said that as long as you graduate with your college degree, you can do whatever you want. And it just so happened that when I went um, to college to study psychology, um, that gave me time to explore music more. And I became part of this choral group um, in college. And we Classical choral? Classical choral. And, really? and I'm still very much um, in touch with my classical choral background. I sing soprano or alto. And in fact, the choirs I, I was with, um, we traveled internationally. That's why we went to Germany. Um, and when I went to the U.S. with my choir, that's when I discovered that there's actually a career path that combined the love for music and technology. Because I've always loved music, um, despite my parents telling me not pursue music. So did you study music at all? Um, I studied piano when I was a kid. Um, but no, like, real classical training in that sense. I'm just asking because you, since you've good, been in a choir. Yeah, but, um, you know. in a way, um, the, the Filipino experience of choral music is very much... Um, uh, a unique experience. It's like there's a big community of, of choral music in the Philippines and that really immersed me in the classical side and it's funny because it's kind of like a uh, it's a joke that I rebel from my my pop rock um, background by going into classical choral music but yeah um, but when I got uh, so I've always loved music and technology but I was never really a songwriter or producer I just love music but I got my dad's love for technology, building computers when I was a kid, uh -huh. and I just knew I wanted to combine it, but I didn't know how. But when I went to the U.S. with my choir, that's when I discovered that there's such a thing as music production and engineering. And ah. that's when everything became laser focused, and I graduated psychology, and I'm free. I, I can do whatever. <laughs> so, so you walked into a studio one day, and you saw all the twinkly lights, and it was like, this is me, right? I s um, at that point, when I heard about this career path, I just, I, I know of pictures. I know of, like, <clears throat> I've been immersed into MTV seeing all these studios. But uh, of course. never really thought I can be that person. And that's when everything clicked, when I knew that I know the road now to, to get to there, to that point. Um, but, yeah, uh, when I, we went back to the Philippines, there's really no audio engineering school in the Philippines. And that's changed now, thankfully. Mm -hmm. um, but back then, I knew that there was no choice but for me to pursue audio engineering studies in here in the US. And I had to prepare. I knew that I wanted to study either in the US or the UK. But 
in the meantime, I'll expose myself to as much technology as possible in, in the Philippines. So um, I was able to get a job teaching multimedia production to, this is very specific, to priests and nuns. Wait, 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 wait. Let's, let's hold, hold it. Hold it. Hold pivots. it. <laughs> okay, yes. first of all, but before we even get into the whole priests and nuns, because yeah. so, there's like so many great jokes there. Yeah. Um, oh, God. But a lot of stories. How did you, I mean, all of a sudden you're teaching. How did you get to that point? Did you already, had you already studied this? So or? I've, um, I've always dabbled into technology. Um, I guess my dad really um, encouraged that um, when I was a kid. And even before, while I was in college and in high school and with the internet being new at the time when I was like earlier in, in my um, teen years, um, I got into graphics design with Photoshop. Um, um, I started building websites. So you were fun. a geek is what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Like we're, we're, <laughs> yeah. I, we're, we're the same. Yep. Um, yep. So I, I was just really very much into that. And in my choral group, I was the one who built the website. I was very much a, a geek in, in many sense of the words. I, I edited videos. Um, and But the thing is, I've always loved audio, but I was never really a composer. So um, it's just, I, I love technology and I absorbed it. I love music, but again, it's it was finding the audio engineering career path that just made sense to me. But yeah, it, I, I had to teach nuns before I got to that point. <laughs> so I, um, I, to this day, I'm really proud of the fact that I've helped um, priests and nuns like do their 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 passion by teaching them how to build websites and 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 hey, what the hell? Edit yeah. videos. <laughs> well, I but, guess I shouldn't say what the hell talking about priests and nuns, but okay. <laughs> but but the the fact of the matter is, when I got that job, um, little did I know that there was also a recording studio at that location and they were looking for an intern and I, I jumped at the chance bingo they, yeah, yeah. Um, I almost didn't get the position um, because just a few days before my internship was going to start um, the head engineer who, who became my friend um, the head engineer made sure to tell me that he almost didn't um, take me on as an intern because he found out that Jet Delinda was a woman um, because Jet is a gen you she wouldn't has, know that yeah. Jet's a, a girl um but it just made me prove, like I must, I was more determined to put the fight prove. into you. Yeah, 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 yeah. of and course. It's like work full day teaching the priests and nuns, and then record music at night. And and so were you recording? Uh, I mean, were you recording the priests and nuns with Catholic no, music, or no. were you recording uh, so rock music? Thankfully, that that um, that recording studio was also very much um, a commercial facility okay. that also offered um, recording services to the um anyone who who needed it and so what, in fact the very first client that, that i assisted in a recording session was a choir group um, um it's like, convenient yeah yeah and, and and even through that entire journey um, of four years i was an intern and then became the in-house recording mixing and mastering engineer and um i was fortunate enough that my mentor taught me how to master using a mastering daw Mm -hmm. even in the Philippines. So all engineers in the Philippines were expected to do everything on their own. And it still happens to everyone. Well, and that's actually good. I yeah, mean, you exactly. You can't complain about that. You know, <laughs> yeah. the whole idea that you can get your hands on. Um, I mean, I have the impression, based on what I already know about you, that you are uh, what we call an autodidact. You know, you're self-taught. Yeah, I think it... it Everyone in, in this, this industry. To a certain extent, yeah. yeah. We are self-taught because there's, thankfully, technology nowadays makes it more accessible for everyone to learn on their own. And, and there's Google. Yeah, there's yeah. Google, there's YouTube, and, yep. and thank God for YouTube. Um, I, oh, yeah. I, yeah. And, yeah, yeah it's, um, that just made it so much more um, empowering for me, um, someone who's all the way in the Philippines, to just decide that this is what I'm going to do now. And, and I'll... I'll kick butt doing it um, and yeah so I, I got into Berkeley College of Music in, in 2009 um, that's when my formal audio engineering studies happened ah, the you know, there's this there's this balance I, I like to talk about the balance of left brain right brain right because you know on the one hand the right brain is all the mm -hmm. creative stuff right mm -hmm. but you couldn't get there without the left brain you know yeah. whether you're a musician who's using the left brain to learn technique or whether you're an engineer, mm -hmm. whatever it is, you know, that, that whole technical 
analysis, analytical part of your brain. Yeah. That's something that, you know, you have to have in order to, to deal with this shit. Exactly. Know? And, and uh, there comes a point where if you're like heavily more um, left leaning, um, you just, you end up collaborating with the right leaning like artists. Yes. And, and that's when for me, um, it's, it, for me, I call, what I'm doing right now feels so much like a dream job just because um, here I am engineering and actually like helping all these amazing artists just bring their music to life. And that for me is like a freaking dream job. <laughs> it's like just. So, let, so let's, I, I want to get to that in a minute, but I want to circle <laughs> yeah. around it because I, I want to also ask you, I, I know that um, some of your earlier work was as an engineer in a studio, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Working with artists. Yes. And. You know, it's always interesting because there's there's a million different paths, and and you and I both talk to a lot of you know younger students coming up, and there's like a million jobs that students have no idea even exist. Yep. Right. Yep. So for you, you started out working, let's say, with artists, mm -hmm. and I think uh, I don't even have to ask you. I'm sure that the psychology degree helped a whole oh, lot. Oh, dude, um, right? I always <laughs> joke that it's like in a way us recording engineers, mixers. We're kind of like bartenders. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. We are there to listen. Like we're not, we're not just there to like help you guys make music and, and bring it to life and realize your vision. But we're also kind of like the the we absorb all oh. the stories and all. We're, we're cheerleaders. We're den mothers. <laughs> yeah. We're everything. Yes, absolutely, exactly. absolutely. We're the bartenders, and and what what ends up in the studio stays in the studio. It's oh, like absolutely. You have to build that trust. But what's interesting to me is that. You went this path from from that mm -hmm. to mastering. Yeah. It's not just a different gig. There's a different mentality there. And especially to a certain extent, it's a lot more insular. You're not really working with the artist. You're working yeah. on the artist's material. But you don't have that back and forth of being in the studio. Mm -hmm. You don't have that whole thing of coaxing a performance or getting involved in the creative process Good observation yeah. right mm -hmm. it, it's 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 a it's a solitary job in certain sense yeah and and one thing to keep in mind um when you get to the mastering stage is the music that gets to you has already been approved it's like the, yeah, the, the mixes are done yeah like yeah, the artistic yeah. vision like the whole intent was approved and that's the goal when when something is being mixed so what's the role of the mastering engineer it's like we're not there to coax the the um instrumentalists the producers into like we're not there as as producing the the creation right. of you're the not music. coaxing a performance yes right. yes but the point is we are at a unique position to be um the final um gate for for quality check and mm -hmm. there's a lot of room for creative um, input when it happens. And, and we're also in this unique position to having a room that's finely tuned, not just in the speakers, but to us. And we're able to work. And, and mastering engineers don't have golden ears, just to make that clear. It's not, we're, we're not like destined to be in this position because- Next thing you can tell me is there's no Santa Claus. <laughs> Oh, oh. <laughs> um, but the the reality is, um, we end up becoming really sensitive and nuanced with our uh, mastering decisions because we do it on a, such a daily basis, on a very consistent workflow, and and we do this with so many artists that the whole craft of mastering is just something that is internalized to us in our room. So we're able to make this um, ten percent. Um, final adjustments to the music that's already improved and it's not to change what's already been approved it's but to bring certain things out yeah basically. and and just to yeah. enhance it to make sure that what's intended in the music is translated to as many different playback systems mm -hmm. formats our goal is to make the mixer the artist the producer the labels look good and, and that their intent is translated no matter the format and yeah that's that's what we try <laughs> Was this, was this a difficult transition for you to go from working yes. with groups of people mm -hmm. to basically being in a room by yourself almost? Uh, it's interesting because um, the the whole collaborative process doesn't go away. Um, and but it's it's definitely different though. Yeah, it's different. Uh, so one thing we always encourage is we still communicate with the client. Um, 
but we try to do it in a way where there's not many chefs in the kitchen. We speak to one um, representative of, of the whole production. And if there's ever any feedback, they can like um, right. talk the whole it over themselves. Call me. Yeah. Say, Whoever it is, <laughs> you're the guy that's going to call me. Nobody yeah, else. Yeah. yeah okay. And, and, and uh -huh. I'm sure that like mixers um, would want for that scenario too. It's Absolutely. Like, yeah. And um, that happens anyway in dynamics and in, in a in any kind of collaborative process. Exactly. But, um, yeah, but we always try to encourage collaboration. Um, the collaboration doesn't stop um, at the mastering stage. And, in fact, when you work with a lot of independent artists who admit that they've never mastered their music before, um, there's also the other end of the spectrum where they're afraid to share what they feel. Mm. They feel that they send their music for mastering and it's just going to be like, we just throw in some sparkles and ta-da, it's, it's there. But oh, yeah, but come the, on, that's all you guys do. We know that. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it happens sometimes, sure. Um, but having the feedback and, and, and understanding, and like picking the brain of the artist is mm -hmm. such a big part of the, oh, the sure. thought process. And um, yeah, and, and there are times, like I encourage the artist to share as much as they could. And there are times where they feel that they, um, they need to speak in in artistic terms and we're artists too and and we encourage that like um i, I had a, a session recently where the artist wanted the music to sound smoky i had a guitar player ask me <laughs> to make that. his guitar sound more brown i totally understand <laughs> i've had purple purple yeah. no that's that's a different eq <laughs> yeah 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 different limiter setting mm -hmm. yeah um but but yeah it's like and and if that's the most comfortable way you feel to express um, what your vision is, don't hesitate. We'll do it. And your you experience in working in that other realm yeah. definitely helped that, no doubt. Yeah, no exactly. Doubt. And, and um, the, another joke that I like to say when, when I'm at a mastering panel is that none of us mastering engineers when we were kids ever say that we want to be mastering engineers going and, up. And, and <laughs> see that, and now you just led me to exactly yeah. the question I was going to ask mm -hmm. you because. You know, and again, we both talk to a lot of students, mm -hmm. and um, it's funny because I had this conversation also with with our good friend Jerry Palumbo, and she said the same Jerry's thing. You know, so we sweet. talk about the idea hi, of when you're hi Jerry, when when you're young, you're laser focused on this. I'm gonna be that thing, yeah, and then yeah. you know, um, I call it aperture blur because you're so focused I on that, that thing, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. there, everything else around it is completely you know not not on your radar and yet in the process of getting to that place you you meander so many other places as a as a as a human being you know yeah. and we we are fueled by all these other events and stuff like that you never know where you're really going to end up no like I, again i i'm sure like for you too it was the same scenario that we never really told ourselves as kids that we wanted to be what we're doing right now. I was going to be a rock star. Are you kidding? <laughs> I was going to be a rock star, and then after that, I was going to be a famous producer. On second grade, I wanted to be a pilot and surgeon. Awesome. At the same yeah, time? Yeah. And a lot of people joke that, oh, what you're doing right now is kind of like It's surgery, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's true. Yeah, yeah. So. But, it, but it's interesting if you think about the fact that really none of us ends up where we think we're going to end up. That's very true, man. But at the same time, Everything we do leads to something else. And that's one of the things that I really love is the idea that most of us, we've dabbled in a million different things. And one of the things that I'm fond of saying is, you know, there's this old cliche about jack of all trades and master of none. And yeah, I've done so many different things and I'm sure you have too. And a lot of them have absolutely nothing to do with what we do now. But they kind of do. But they do. Yeah. Exactly. And, you know, I took a psychology course in college, too, and I had no <laughs> idea why, except that it sounded interesting to me. Yeah. And, boy, have I used it so many times with bands, with artists, you know. And I think it's really interesting how all of these things really play into where we end up. And I'm sure this isn't your last gig, either. I mean, you're going to, yeah. you know, you're... And, and I have to, like, even remind myself that, like, pivots in careers are going to happen. And, and, like, for many of us, like, even if you've won a Grammy, 
the career pivots are going to happen, and and oh, especially yeah, 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 and uh, exactly, and um, it's like us when we were kids when we didn't anticipate that I'd be a mastering engineer. I don't know what I'd be doing in like forty years, and 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 we all have to keep an open mind to that. Well, and the other thing that I think makes us who we are is there's a curiosity factor, mm -hmm. and I like to joke that it's a little bit of. Um, I have often said that I'm a lead actor in short attention span theater, you know, because <laughs> I am constantly looking for something new. But you kick butt in whichever, like, new venture. But that's what you do, yeah. right? And, and that's the thing. It's like, you, you know, there's always some new, exciting, interesting thing. And it's, you know, it's kind of like we all suffer from a case of, you know, squirrel. Because <laughs> you get, you know, you, you're doing something. Um, you know, I, I wanted so badly to be a recording engineer. And then I spent couple of years being a recording engineer and it's not that I disliked it but at a certain point I was like you, you know discover, I've done yeah, this yeah you know and I was always thinking ahead like when I was being an assistant I always wanted to be thinking like an engineer when I was an engineer I was thinking like a producer and I was watching these other producers and saying oh yeah you know I really want to work with the artists and I think that's part of it too is open mind open mind and also just always being interested in the other peripheral things. Yeah, I think it's also worth remembering that for everyone working in, in the entertainment industry, the fact that we're in music, no matter what um, sub-career path or niche field, we're still in music. Yeah. So no matter what, even if you're like so fixated that, oh, I want to be a forensic audio expert. Whoa. Yeah, well, <laughs> the thing is, even if you're you're not a forensic audio expert and you end up as a podcast engineer, we're still in this world together and, and the passion is still there. So yeah. like for you, 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 um, you stayed true to what made you passionate and what kept you happy. And that's what led you to where you are now. Yeah. And the, and the same thing is true for you and for, for most of us, I mm -hmm. think, you know, we, we don't necessarily know where we're ending up, but we know that we're on the road. Yeah. You know, and, and, the, and um, my advice usually for, for the young, um, like, aspiring audio engineers is if they're very fixated on, on one specific path that they learned about when they were growing up, um, I just tell them to keep an open mind. Because if they get so fixated, like what you were saying, aper aperture... Uh, aperture blur? Yeah, uh -huh. aperture uh -huh. blur. Um, if they get so fixated, they're closing down the doors to other opportunities. And they might realize that there's actually one other path that you're happier with because you might be too fixated to one thing and then when you get there you realize that oh this isn't my thing really yeah. like when you were saying about the recording path yeah well you know and i i mean i discovered that in producing bands I was like yeah you know what this is wonderful and i really enjoy it at the same time you know there's a lot of there's a lot of things about it that are very very stressful you know, a friend of mine and I, um, we joke about the fact that, you know, if if a record does really well, great band, great, you know, fantastic artist. Yeah. If it bombs, uh, lousy producer. It's like, that's the thing. It's yeah. even like for, for mastering or live sound. Mm -hmm. If it if it was perfect, no one's going to pay attention to like how it got right. perfect. But the one time that something goes wrong, yeah, that's when like they notice you. It's yeah. Well, yeah. also, the other part about it is that part of what we do, at least for me, the ethos of being a good producer is to leave no trace. You know, the best producers, in my opinion, are people who you say, wow, you did this and you did that and they're so different. And yeah. I didn't even know it was you, yeah, you know, that's a sign of like a bad. Exactly. Producer, exactly. As opposed to and, you know, and. All due respect to producers who have their own sound. Signature, there yeah. are many of them, and they are wonderful. To me, I think part of what really is an art of doing these kind of things is to say, I want to realize the artist's vision, and I want to leave none of my own fingerprints on it. Yeah, and, and that's what makes it satisfying, too, in mastering, is yeah. that like, the fact that you're able to like take that vision of the artist and make it possible. Right. Yeah, that's, that's what keeps me going. Do you miss working with other artists? That's I mean, in, in a in a studio setting, in that you sense. You know what? Um, thankfully, I don't. Uh, I haven't really like lost touch of that because uh -huh. um, 
I, I master full time now. I, I cut vinyl records too. Um, mm. But the the one time that I kind of get get outside of that and wear a producer or mixing hat is in choral music. I still do that from ah. time to time. Um, I, I do a lot of um, choral mixing for um, like a lot of choral groups here in the U.S. and in the Philippines. And in fact, um, Tonality, the choir that I'm part of here in Los Angeles, um, the song that I produced, mixed, and, and mastered for Tonality um, got a Grammy nomination this year. Um, Sweet. Yeah, it's, it's, Love it. it's amazing. Like, um, so it's, it's in the best arrangement category. Um, and I'm, I'm really proud that all the people that came together, was we were able to like, bring it to a point where it really showcased the arranger's amazing music. And it combined my love for, for mastering and choral music, which is like a, a, an cool. extra amazing thing. Got you to flex muscles that you hadn't flexed in a while, too. Yeah, yeah that's cool. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm still a choir nerd. But um, even with my, my passion for choral music, it's, pop music is just such an internal part of who I am with my background that I can't let go of, of mastering. Like, mastering is, like my passion and then I'm just glad that I got to this point because again I never really thought that I'd be in mastering and when I was growing when I was starting in my career my aperture blur is not mastering it was classical um, engineering like um, scoring engineer Ooh. yeah and, and in fact um, this is a good story um, when I was in Berkeley everyone had bedroom studios of course but I had a mobile recording rig <laughs> So take that. Like All I right. No competition. Um, <laughs> so I would record um, orchestra ensembles um, in um, the MIT Kresge Auditorium, Harvard. Um, I get called to do live sound with my rig um, for different ensembles in Berkeley. Well, but you had a nice little mic closet with you. Yes. Yeah, uh-huh. It's a tiny one, but I'm oh, like proud of it. Um, yeah. But um, so there was actually a job waiting for me um, before graduating, too. I was... Um, uh, I was actually hired to already be a recording engineer for the Aspen Music Festival when I was... Oh, cool. Yeah, it was, like, amazing. It, this is what I wanted to do. Uh-huh. But um, this international student's employment authorization card did not arrive on time. So um, just because my um, international authorization card to, to work after graduating for one year did mm-hmm. not arrive on time, they had to drop me off of the that position. So, yeah, I, I suddenly... Everything happens for a reason, right? Yeah, and, and um, international students have one year. During mm-hmm. my time, it's changed now, but they have one year to do whatever they want to as um, a professional here in the U.S. Mm-hmm. And then after one year, you either have need to have a work visa or, or go back to your home country. And, yeah, so the first three months of that year suddenly open is not good. So, I got time on my hands. Yeah, uh-huh. um, so it was like... <laughs> That's when I, I had to like flex my like I need help muscles and uh-huh. and, and thankfully um, just because of, of how much um, time I've I've dedicated to just working in, in the Berkeley studios um, the audio engineering um, chair uh, introduced me to Avatar Studios I was able to submit an internship application Avatar that's the Avatar power station, is right? now Power yeah, Station yeah, yeah, yeah. so okay. uh-huh. I was in Power Station uh, I interned there um, as soon as I graduated Also oh, you lived in New York for a while Yes I lived in New York for one year I grew up in New York so Of yeah. course <laughs> I got that from, <laughs> um, so uh, yeah um, after my 3 month internship I got hired by one of the producers that have a, a room in Avatar Studios, Jerry Barnes. Uh-huh. So Jerry Barnes is a producer um, of Nile Rogers, um, Roberta Flack, mm-hmm. um, Chic. And yeah, I thought that's going to be my life already. I will be like the uh, producer's engineer. And uh-huh. I lived for that. Like, um, you I could do worse. <laughs> <laughs> I was in my element uh-huh. just because um, Jerry Barnes is just like no holds barred. He... He knows what you're capable of, and uh-huh. while he asks you to do this all this complicated stuff, he just riffs his bass guitar while waiting for you to do whatever <laughs> um, challenge he asks you to do. So mm-hmm. that was my life, but then I got a call um, from Jonathan Weiner, who's a professor of mastering. Oh, I know Jonathan. Jonathan. Yes. In fact, um, he's been on our show. Oh, of yeah. course. Um, hi, Jonathan. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I, I got um, a call from Jonathan asking me if I'd consider a possible opportunity to apply um, to be the next assistant of Doug Sachs. Uh So I didn't know what the position is, but it's something mastering related. 
And um, just because I've known mastering when I attended Berkeley and really got drawn into it, I, I really enjoyed mastering when I was like taking his class and then somehow it, it left a mark on Jonathan. I could see that appealing, especially because you've got such a technical bent. Yeah. <laughs> I could see why, because, you know, the thing is, the mastering is the last mile, so to speak. And it's... It's so subtle and yet so radical. Yeah, it's like it's amazing how it's subtle, but it makes so much impact. And yeah. and it's funny because a lot of there's a lot of mastering engineers I know that have a classical background. So oh, of course, my my good yeah. friend and and colleague, um, uh, well, Bob Ludwig of all mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. people, uh, he um, went to Eastman. Um, Doug Sachs, uh, my mentor. Um, played the trumpet um so and eric boulanger here in the bakery he's, sure. he's a violinist so we all have a, a classical background and yeah th that that sensibility in classical music and, and just being so precise but also using that precision to express something like um something from a sheet music to a full-on yes. performance really yes. helps. Um, it's an interesting observation, though, mm -hmm. because it's, it's really true. So many mastering engineers have a classical background, and I think part of the reason for that is because in classical music, there's this art form of separating the instruments and yet blending the instruments. There's a lot of mixing. It's like um, yeah. the, the, um, the performance itself like you, you really use the the acoustics of of the venue and yes. the conductor the music director ends up kind of like being a mixer like um especially in choral music um depending on the music too you adjust where the singers are placed yes in the ensemble yes. whether it's like soprano tenor alto, alto bass or like completely mixed singers well in orchestral music too yeah exactly know. so it's, there's a lot of um like live uh, mixing that happens internally within the instrumentalists and the I mixed singers. a big band and oh, you know, nice. that's that's also a, you know ah. it's a, and, and that especially because until you've done that you have no idea what the dynamics are man trumpets are freaking loud yeah you know <laughs> and and so you really have to be very conscious of okay so I need to move you guys back a few feet you mm -hmm. know and, and there really is this natural balance there yeah, yeah. but at the same time you know even though you're trying to blend these things you also want to be able in the final result to literally pick out almost every instrument yeah exactly as, as a musical director that's like really satisfying yeah. um and i also found that um in classical music when i was performing with my choir too it's like no matter what is written on the sheet music um you also have to like um really be bold and not hesitate when you're performing yeah, it's yeah. like and, and there has to be like a certain synergy among the individual um, musicians and it kind of like translates here too, where it's like collaboration still yeah. continues. So. And the same thing is true with rock bands in yeah, a different way. You exactly. know, there's those dynamics there's, and there's, you know, yeah, like holistic. It's like there's something um, like intangible that musicians experience when they perform live well and that you know to me that was always the thing that really drew me to the right brain side is the whole the collaborative process the creative yeah, process where you have this this magic mm -hmm. going on and that yeah. you know you can experience that in yeah. in any you know i mean i've experienced it with hard any rock genre, bands yeah. i've experienced it playing bluegrass mm, you know mm -hmm. i mean any time that you lock with another person it's um it's it's in a way it's like falling in love. Yeah, you yeah. know it's this really it's this moment between people. Yeah, where you just like, oh, oh and and you know really it it's just such a a magical moment. Yeah. and that to me, I, and I guess that's why I asked you the question about mastering because mm. for me, that was the part of working with artists and producing artists that that's I really different. loved, mm -hmm. was getting to that point where there's that magic, and you get that moment and. I'm sure I'm sure that is you know something that you probably miss when you're working by yourself. Yeah, that's why um our studio is designed so that we encourage um artists to come in yeah. when, when they attend yeah. mastering sessions and it's so different when they're here and you're mastering cuz they Oh, I bet. I'm like I love the feeling when they hear the before and after. Yeah. mastering and and 
um, yeah, that that whole collaborative process. It's different from mixing and and recording because it's like less involved. It's like they let you just do your thing. Mm -hmm. But they all, um, I really appreciate when the artists are here and and they're able to um, confirm if this is like, yeah, yeah. we're we're yeah. getting there. Oh my god, I hear the difference. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then it, it's unfortunate that during the past two years, like um, uh, we've limited the um having attended sessions sure. but thankfully um just because of mastering being very um minimal adjustment like a lot of the collaboration that happens through the phone and by email mm -hmm. um as long as i get an a re an accurate picture of what they're going for um right. yeah like we're still able to to do our jobs um and you know what even if so so another um perk of mastering that i think is related to what what you're saying about like having that collaborative um experience mm -hmm. the one awesome thing about mastering is that um you get to work with so many artists in a short span of time and such a diverse array i mean diverse, i was looking at your credits You've, yeah <laughs> the stuff that you have mastered is so yeah. like from left field to right field if you're really? a music lover, like mastering is is the shit. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, well, master. If if you love yeah, music, true. mastering is is amazing because, um, the the fact of uh, the goal of mastering is that no matter the genre, you're making sure that it translates to the music marketplace. So you're not just you might be famous for one genre, but you can be a mastering engineer for all these different genres. And, and be effective at it but and it flexes your muscles too yeah no doubt, because you've got to listen for different things exactly and and you end up just just getting to know all these amazing musicians yeah, that, that, that you too. freaking admire and you're and you become part of like um realizing their vision so on in the morning i might have like a, a hard-hitting hip-hop record um, in the afternoon it could be like a score album and in the evening, you might have um, Indian um, esoteric, like electronic music. I think and... we should flip those around. <laughs> End yeah, with the hip hop. Oh my gosh! You know? <laughs> like I, I actually do save the hard hitting like rock or hip hop because yeah. I'm like I can like get get so much like out of my system just by like. That's why like it's, being in the yeah. recording studio is is just as amazing because yeah. you still get exposed to all these like different production you sessions. You do. Yeah. You do. So. Yeah, so. Uh, because we talk to a lot of students, you and I both, I'll ask you the question that I ask a lot of people. Okay. Jeez. What would you tell 15-year-old you? Oh, man. Oh. <laughs> um, I guess just trust. Um, like, it's weird because if, if I tell my 15-year-old self that um, by the time I'm 38 years old now, uh, well, no, I, I keep forgetting. I'm 37. I'm turning 37 tomorrow. <laughs> You're turning yeah. 37 tomorrow? Yeah, well, yeah. happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. All right. <laughs> but um, if I tell my 15-year-old self that I'd be in L.A. and I've um, worked on a Pink Floyd record, Elvis Costello, and, and worked on Minecraft, and, and it's probably <laughs> like, what are you smoking, Jeff? Mm -hmm. like, I want some of that. Yeah, because yeah, <laughs> when I was 15 years old, I was in... Uh, high school like drawing anime characters and like just enjoying music and, and life but mm -hmm. never thought that I would discover my my passion because it's like I was lost in high school I didn't know what I wanted to do well and that's typical for the age, yes. age appropriate yes but but the thing is it's like you're surrounded by um, a supportive family um, and you, you kind of know what you want it's like you might not know you might not really clearly know because it's not presented to you yet but just trust and 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 believe in yourself like especially for women in in this industry there's always a case of imposter syndrome and oh you you segued into that so nicely because that was what I, that was where i wanted to go with this yeah i'm reading your mind ah, thank you i like that yeah mm -hmm. um but yeah like um imposter syndrome um and, and that's real for all of us. It, it yeah, is real exactly. for all of us. I, I, thank you. That's a but good think, reminder. But, but you know, I, you took it where I wanted it mm -hmm. to go because the thing is also, as a woman, mm -hmm. you're fighting certain things. But at the same time, um, one of the things that's interesting to me is that a lot of the women that I talk to who have been successful, it's not that they 
didn't have to deal with sexism, because of course you have to deal with it. But there is a way of dealing with it where you disempower it. And what yeah. I mean by that is <laughs> it's not that you fight. Yeah. I mean, yes, of course, there are times when you have to fight. Mm -hmm. There are times mm -hmm. when you have to just tell some, some <laughs> asshole that they are one. But, yeah. but there's a certain, by, by basically disarming it, disempowering it, mm -hmm. you know, by saying, no, I'm not going to accept the legitimacy yeah. of this, you know, of you treating me this way. Mm -hmm. And um, that's exactly right, um, Daniel, because um, how I've dealt with it when, when I encounter those situations is, like, for example, like being told that, that I almost didn't get something because someone found out that Jet's, Jet's not a dude. Um, it's more like a That's fuel. Like a great song title, right there. That's not a dude. That's not a dude. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag. Um, but it's it's more of like it adds fuel to the fire. Sure. Because like it's so funny because I experience imposter syndrome, but also I know that I'm good at what I do. Like and and the thing is, I know a lot of my colleagues and and a lot of women in this um, business and and even like not just women but also men that are in this. We know what we're capable of. It's like. Yeah, I know what I'm doing. I'm 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 good at what I do. But um all the voices in your head that tell you that that um that you're not good enough, it's a reminder. It there's kind of like a, a unconscious um fire that gets set when when you're told that you're not good enough. Oh yeah. So it's, it's a like, challenge. Yeah, yeah, it's a challenge, mm -hmm. but at the same time, the people who who end up like um pushing you to a corner and like um, discouraging you in a way it's like there's got to be some things that they're going through that um, pushes them to like be negative towards others sure. so sure and um, you have to treat them with a certain amount of compassion exactly in a way. it's like compassion and understanding and just um focusing on yourself yeah and and like celebrating what you're good at and and, and i still try to remind myself that like um you know what you're capable of so keep on going and there's going to be a time that 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 um it, your hard work will pay off and and it's going to be much harder at times just because there's less opportunities but um if you keep on working hard and and just um just telling yourself that you're good at what you do it's like um you end up getting luckier in a way. That's it. That's it. And, and you know, there's as as hippy dippy as it sounds, you practice gratitude. Yeah. And, you and know, it, it, like, it's, it's like instead of being pissed off at the world, you know, and being a victim, mm -hmm. you say, you know what? Look at all the things I'm good at. Look at the success I've have had. Mm -hmm. You know, I can I can do this. Yeah. You know? and, and, and it's so hard for self-taught people. Exactly. Especially. Oh, my gosh. But but here's also the thing like a lot of people think that um the only way to success is like finding a mentor like like i am fortunate and privileged i, I got to learn under doug Sachs, but i also know of amazing mastering engineers that did not really go through a mentor and 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 they're like really amazing at what they do it's like i want to give a shout out to this master engineer katie tavini based in United Kingdom who's just doing absolutely amazing and hi Katie hi Katie um but yeah so and, and there's many more amazing engineers it's, so mentorship is not the only way and and self-teaching and and like really getting yourself out there and collaborating is what's that's gonna it. get that's you ahead. it yeah cause... you know because it, you know you just you just mentioned exactly what it is because it's Technology. not just about mentoring it's about networking. Yeah. And I think that's so important. You know, um, the whole idea of don't ever dismiss somebody else because they could end up being your boss, you know, but it goes beyond that. It's just, you know, everybody's got something to teach you. Yeah. And, and uh, like, I'm, I'm an introvert. So it's like the word networking is like, uh, it's tough, it's I know. tough but I, know. I tell myself that in a way, networking is kind of like finding your community. Yes. Because fine, Nam show is like overwhelming sometimes, but these are people who just love the same thing that you do, and yeah. and these artists and these musicians are like just just like you, and and in a way, it's really cool to find your tribe who like gets you on that level. So like with Sound Girls, Women's Audio Mission, and 
audio engineering society like it's finding all these people who are like like-minded so it's, yes. it's freaking cool yes and also just you know the realization that we all have our strong suits we all have weaknesses mm -hmm. and we're all here to support each other yeah and, yeah, and, and that's yeah i mean for me that's been really the most amazing thing is just thinking about well i know somebody who can, t can answer this question for me you know yeah um and i'm um, related to that too like for me the the musicians i collaborate with are kind of like my mentors too yes because if, big time yeah because if they hear something on the master and they tell me um, what they want. It's like it. I kind of like it opens like a new perspective on on the session, and I learn so much from from the people I, I work with. So, yeah, it's like um, by staying humble and not having your ego get in the way, you end up like gaining so much more. So it's true, and that's great advice right yeah. there. <laughs> stay humble. Yeah, stay humble. Even like Bob Ludwig and then Doug Sachs, who have like all these amazing achievements stay humble so even you know al schmidt rest in peace oh my you know? gosh, i mean yeah people who have done so much and you know that's for me one of the things that always amazed me was the bigger they are the more humble they are most of the time yeah yeah you know? <laughs> that's that's very it's, true it's the young struggling ones you got to watch out for yeah, it's like competition <laughs> man and 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 also just to add like um like a lot of people tend to say that women are competitive against other women um and i try to like um uh like fix that myth because the sense of competition tends to happen because like music is already a competitive industry and sometimes um because there's less women um like the people who are also in this industry kind of like end up like propagating that um like limiting the seat at the table yeah so by bringing in more women and uplifting more women that actually like opens the and, and adds more seat to the table for more yeah. like representation and diversity so yeah yeah like collaboration You've been doing your part mm -hmm. that's for sure we try <laughs> jet galindo thank you for being my guest thank you daniel it's been thank a pleasure you. thank you so much for, for coming here and, and i had a great time Likewise. Yeah, I, I'm awaiting your memoir for your story. <laughs> I'm going to read that. You may have wait a while. I don't know. <laughs> I haven't had time yet. Hey, I'm Daniel Keller. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and join us each week for Insights and Sound.